This video is going to be a bingeable compilation of my two video essays on Anatomy of a Fall. The first one called Anatomy of a Fall's Warning to Men, which explores what and who really killed Samuel. And the second one on how the movie constantly frames Sandra as a character who has much to hide. And that video is called How Anatomy of a Fall Writes Women with Secrets. I hope you enjoyed this ultimate guide. The second most heartbreaking part of Anatomy of a Fall is Samuel's death. So suddenly this father and husband is ripped away from his loving family in such a gruesome way. But the most heartbreaking part of Anatomy of a Fall lies in the psychology behind Samuel's death. It's in the why he died and who killed him. And that's why in this video we're going to be discussing the three main takeaways from the argument between Sandra and Samuel and how it carefully and brilliantly pieces together who really killed Samuel. First of all, obviously Sandra is innocent. We have to agree on that first for any of this to work. She simply has no motivation to kill Samuel and you can really tell what her feelings on Samuel are from their argument, which are not at all malicious, which is going to be the main course of this video. But if you want a full explanation on why I don't think Sandra killed Samuel, you can either click the video link above or you can wait to the end of the ultimate guide. That's the second video. But even if she did kill him in this story, it wouldn't matter because Samuel was dead long before he ever fell out of the house. And if you like for an insightful video essays on films and popular culture, hit the subscribe button and stick around. So here are the three takeaways from the argument. An argument that is extremely important because it's the only point in the movie where we really get to experience Samuel as an entity while he was alive. And it's such a big deal in this movie because of how it's framed as the climax of the story. The first takeaway from the argument and the first step Samuel takes onto the other side is that Samuel stank. Samuel had succumbed to failure through a vicious cycle of anxiety, victimhood and perfectionism. He wanted to be a writer but he could never write. He never gave himself the time. He busied himself with other things, telling himself that he was being generous and selfless while neglecting the things that he really wanted and he could have achieved at more or less the same time, while building a resentment for himself and his wife Sandra who always managed to achieve exactly what she wanted. He experienced failure as a writer and then eventually as a father, when at the age of four their son Daniel lost his eyesight during an accident that occurred on Samuel's watch. So much like how he ran to teaching to avoid his failure as a writer, he ran to homeschooling Daniel to try and escape his failure as a father that one time. It ate him up from the inside. There's nothing wrong with him having a job as a teacher, even putting off writing and choosing to homeschool Daniel and have a closer impact in his son's life and having a stronger connection with his son. But as Sandra says, Your generosity conceals something dirtier and meaner. If Samuel was doing these things because he wanted to, because he truly cared, and because they truly gave him fulfillment, he would be happy. But his envy of Sandra's relative lack of life problems, so to speak, shows that to him it was more a competition of who can be the better person, who is sacrificing more for the sake of looking like the better family member. Couple that with his age. And now you wake up and you're 40 and you need someone to blame. Wait, but what does his age have to do with this really? Well, part of the brilliance of the character is how it's written in such a way that it ex exposes things, real things about male psychology. Hence the title of this video probably being Anatomy of the Falls Warning to Men. Samuel is going through a midlife crisis. It's a phenomenon overwhelmingly felt by men, though it is felt by a lot of women too, between the ages of 35 and 55, as they are at a point in their life now, or they're getting to a point in their life now, where they are closer to death than birth. So their lives start to sort of flash before their eyes. They think about all the things that they never got to do, the things that they said that they would do that they never achieved, the things that they gave up due to responsibility to their children, their spouse, their family members. And this especially happens to men who sacrifice quite a bit of their youth for the attainment of status and wealth. Think about the surgeon who gives up 15 years of essentially his entire young adult life to get ahead, to properly establish himself in the industry that he wants to be. It's a time when people are then prone to excessive spending because now they have the money and the status and promiscuity, infidelity, you know, trying to catch up on all the things that they either gave up too early to focus on their life or the things that they never got at all. And here's the thing with Samuel. He doesn't seem to want to do that. I mean, that might be part of the reason that he's building the house. That might have a bit of a spending component. But for the most part, it seems instead of expanding his boundaries, maybe for moral reasons or for the self-righteous reasons that I stated before, and doing crazy things, he decides to implode and shrink like a dying star while throwing a good old blame game into the mix to try and get Sandra to feel bad about her own life choices. As seeing her take part of his work and be practical about her process of writing and 
excelling at it and also being happy with her relationship with her son Danielle walking around the house generally drinking wine and being cherry that all just rubbed spice in the wound and that leads us directly into takeaway number two Samuel Shrank see where I'm going with this he gave away in order to cope telling himself he was a good person and he would have been if he wasn't committing suicide in the process the ends don't justify the means after all he was blindly generous while letting go of the dreams that he had so much that he started to give away his soul he lets go of doing the hard work that gave him his higher purpose he stops writing he chooses to become a homeschooling dad that and being a teacher good things noble things but not the things he wanted, certainly not the things that 19-year-old Samuel would have said that he was going to do with his life. And he allowed himself to be eaten up by the idea that he should sacrifice himself and his dreams, and then lies to himself that it's all good because there are at least some benefits from it, which are true. I and mean, he tells himself that he has a better connection with Daniel, but the thing is, it's not a competition. And he sees it as a competition because, well, it's not what he wanted to do in the first place. Meanwhile, resenting that Sandra continues to happily live her life as she sees fit and almost also live the life that he wants to live and perhaps it would have worked too if uh, he wasn't married to a woman so good at the things that he wants to be maybe they could have imploded together but seeing her excel at the things that he wanted the most must have been uncomfortable at the least and by the time they have the argument that they do it's clear that he has a lot of resentment and blame to point in her direction and maybe he would have been fine maybe he would have just laughed it off walked it off but then she did something too she cheated on him she made him feel his size even more and he shrank even further as that undoubtedly gave even more power to the voice in his head telling him that he wasn't worth shit in the first place as she stripped the sense of security that he thought he had with her and that's the only thing i can concretely say that sandra definitely did wrong even though in that argument we then find out that even that is majorly his fault because we find out that they barely had sex after Danielle's accident at the age of four for context Danielle is 11 at the time of this movie and probably like 12 by the end so doing some quick math they have not been together as a couple for over half a decade I mean it might be ignorant to say bro was asking to be cheated on but if you scream in the Himalayas expect an avalanche but that directly leads into my favorite symbolism in this movie with the music being played out loud to disrupt her possible flirting with the beautiful young woman in this house i think this is him trying to expand again to try and assert himself as the male in the house as sandra's partner who she has who has been cheated on before and of course he does it with the instrumental from a genre where men being braggadocious and confident and powerful is the norm they even bring this up in the court trial if you think about it it actually just shows how much he has shrunk in, in in his personality in a hollow house where he can hear them talking from upstairs the music first starts when sandra asks to take the interview to a place of normal conversation and as they start talking freely and laughing even with the music in the background the music gets louder he plays it at a higher volume on loop as he tries to impose himself from far away now, before we see the argument, it can be taken as he deems himself so powerful, his power of his ego, that he can impose himself from across the house. But by the time you see the arguments and you see how much he's really going through internally, it's actually more like a whimper. It's a pain-filled cowardice. And so eventually we get into takeaway number three, Samuel sank into a victim mentality first, as we hear him play the blame game with her, when really in this situation she could have done nothing more without seeming like she was trying to murder him into some sort of self-fulfillment and success. He sank into building his life solely around her, saying that she was imposing herself on him, which of course is really suffocating and stifling as, as an individual. And some people might say that she sort of was, but I think she's just a confident person and multiple times she shows that she's just not willing to bow to the idea of a victim mentality he says let's move to france and they move to france she makes a very good point about the fact that they are on his home turf he has no real reason to feel like she's imposing her life on him as i said in may december insecure people are very dangerous aren't they and then eventually a few months before he actually died he tried to take his own life with a drug overdose that's clearly proven by daniel's experiment later on in the movie he sank into the hole inside of himself so who killed samuel the sandra no i don't think she did at all i think the movie specifically frames her as innocent especially by the end down to the fact that the dog cuddles up to her Don dogs are really good judges of character and so did samuel commit suicide 
on purpose or did he just fall out the window well we never really knew but regardless samuel was already dead a month before the accident ever happened from the moment he tried to od himself to an early grave and perhaps even before then as he had already lost his soul and what is the definition of death if not that as sandra says that stop me stop i did not kill him that's not the point my name is Osirame. i hope you enjoyed this video and check out the next one we go again and as we move before elevates a crime mystery to the level of sophisticated drama by peering into the deep psychological reasons for a couple's disputes possible reasons for one to murder the other while revealing some deep truths about the human condition but my favorite feature of this movie is how it plays with our biases by carefully writing ambiguity and secrecy into the character that we see most in the movie sandra and the character that we see least in the movie samuel they do this in two main ways and here's what they are the first one is how they show us one character and not the other we are probably introduced to sandra but not samuel we don't really know what he's like all we know especially for the first 30 minutes is that he's working upstairs most likely doing some kind of hard manual work and he seems to be a good father apparently able to afford quite a good lifestyle for his wife and son the only really negative ambiguity we are giving of him is when he's playing music in the opening scene which we can interpret as him trying to disrupt sandra's conversation and give us a bit of insight into a possible motive sandra might have for killing him maybe existence with him was stifling and irritating for instance but what we see of sandra is the complete opposite we see a lot in fact in fact maybe too much the camera is fixed on her it follows her around we see that she's cold slightly more masculine than the average woman in fact i knew she was bi from the first scene i mean she clearly has more riz than most guys plus the framing is very flirtatious and her insistence on moving the conversation from something more serious from the interview to a personal conversation with this smile on her face is a dead giveaway and obviously samuel is either a non-caring bastard disrupting a harmless conversation from far away which is hard to believe when you take into account what we've already conceived about his relationship with his family or he's trying in the least violent way to stop an interaction that he knows he and his wife will regret which means he can probably feel this charismatic tension from all the way upstairs which puts even more scrutiny on sandra's character and i mentioned how she has a more masculine air around her because it's part of why it's easier to conceive her as the killer like she's not a cute housewife hiding wickedness behind a nice smile i mean she has a nice smile yes but there's a killer in her eyes and an irritation as well even later on right after his death we see sandra say that she's tired of crying but we never see her crying she's way more put together not as red-eyed and distraught as we're used to seeing a partner of any gender act after just losing their other half it's a very similar framing that makes nick dunn in gone girl seem like the most likely killer in fact it's very very similar to that movie in that with that movie as well we don't really meet the real amy until she wants us to but we are shown a lot of the human pitfalls and inconsistencies of nick's character from the start and so well i'm not saying that he draw direct parallels but i think if you've seen the two movies or any movies or stories that are similar you start to think hey is sandra about to be another possible female rage icon are we going to find out that samuel was just so terrible and maybe she's actually hiding something about him that's why she killed him we're really thrown the bone of if she killed him and most likely she did what did samuel do to deserve it and we don't know in fact that's the one thing the story does not want us to know which leads us to the second takeaway and the second way that the wrap this character these two characters in secrecy and ambiguity the second thing this movie does is that it pulls the rug from under us as we search for clues to solve the why since we already know the how and it does this by showing us what we want to see the things we're suspicious of like everything is set up in such a way that the simplest answer is that sandra killed her husband and yet we are giving hint after hint that she either didn't do this or she had even more sinister reasons or a much more complex complex situation surrounds samuel's death i mean for one thing we're shown that they were going through financial trouble so she doesn't have any monetary reasons to kill him and then sandra says again and again that she had no real problems with him and even paints a really good picture of him sometimes to her own detriment and just as we're starting to believe no maybe she didn't they throw a secret argument audio 
tape in our faces and that keeps us on edge because now there's something again that we still don't know and it's teased and kept until later in the movie as we look for more clues that she is the killer and then eventually we hear the argument just so they can rip the idea of the killer from us once again and the interesting thing here is that we get to see the argument very interesting creative thing nobody at the actual hearing got to see the argument they don't see the nuances in Sandra's face and to understand that she wasn't at all being malicious. All they're hearing is voices. And they could have left it like that for us to the audience. But then it's very hard to sell the idea that Sandra is not the killer. Because when we see it and the way we see it, it shows us that while she's sure being a bit violent by the end of the argument, she's not at all volatile. In fact, for most of it, she's controlled and calm up until the very last moment and it's in fact in this argument that we see that if anything Samuel had all the motivation to kill her she was free of him she always had been he resented that she made small concessions here and there but ultimately she was living life more on her terms than he was on his and then we hear Daniel has something to say because Justin Trier is enjoying watching us suffer and that's the part of the fun of movies of course you know how this ends and in the end Daniel says that Sandra couldn't possibly have killed Samuel because he confirms that his father did tried to kill himself a month earlier. And that whole sequence of the movie is the most tense to me. If you're a dog lover, maybe skip it or prepare to hate Daniel by the end of it. I won't spoil it, just go, go and watch it. So yeah, those are the two things that they do. First of all, we are shown a lot of Sandra, very little Samuel, which helps us to see things about Sandra that are clear and then just imagine that Samuel is the best person in the world on, up until, of course, the argument. And then certain things along the way, they keep not giving us the answer they keep pulling out from under us making it not as simple as well she killed him and this is why but if sandra didn't kill samuel who did click on this video to watch the explanation of the psychology of samuel's death or if this is the end of the ultimate guide thank you very much for watching my name is osiram and i'll see you soon peace Justin Trier.